Have you heard Vine, Bob, and Jasang by the Vienna's Boy Choir? Boys Choir? This guy gets creepier by the minute. <laughs> Haven't heard that version. I'll have to check it out. Dude, it's transcendent. Transcendence? Who talks that way? What the fuck is Janet doing with this guy? And who does he think he's fooling with all that transcendent bullshit anyway? I know he's a heartless little fucker deep down. I fucking see you, Jim. You're not fooling me with your Bordeaux wines and your boys choir bullshit. And if Janet were awake enough to see you through the splintered glass of her broken life, she'd recognize you too. Fuck you, Jim, I want to tell you. You little fucking prick. It's ghost towns. Her choice of venue says it all. She's not selected the food court for its cornucopia of flavorful choices, but for its singular lack of intimacy and plentiful escape routes. It's easy to see from the way she strides purposely past Quiznos, clutching her purse in a manila folder, that she intends to make this a short meeting. Even her attire is businesslike, from her modest lavender blouse, the color of sexual frustration, to her gray pencil skirt, right down to her closed-toed leather flats. Her expression is benign but determined, thin-lipped and straight, neither hard nor soft in announcing itself, the expression of a woman collecting sperm samples. Though she's walking straight for me, she does not invite eye contact, rather engages some fixed point behind me. Already she's a stranger to me, yet achingly familiar. Smoothing the rump of her skirt, she slides into the fixed metal stool across from me, heaving a sigh as she sets her purse and envelope on the tabletop. Tacoma was a mess, sorry, she says. Her hair has grown out a shade darker than almond with auburn highlights. Two years ago, she all but shaved her head completely. She looked like a Polish POW. Now her hair is lustrous and looks as if it smells good, like beet scented wax. She parts it in the center, just as she did when I first met her, from which point it cascades evenly down both sides of her face, two inches below the jawline. You look good, I say. I look old, she says. I feel old. Though I've dressed young myself in jeans and chucks and a penguin shirt, I wonder if it doesn't have the opposite effect. I'm the one who's aged. You look fine, she says. You look the same as you looked three years ago. She's managed to make it an insult. Don't worry, I'm not. She slides the envelope across the plastic table. I brought you these in case you lost them. I've got the papers. Then you brought them? I thought we were having lunch. She tenses up and stares out across the food court toward Macy's, looking spent. She just drove 160 odd miles for this. I want to set my hand atop of hers and give it a little squeeze. The squeeze I gave it a thousand times before the disaster, when they found the cyst, when her brother died, when Jody had a staph infection, when Piper had the chicken pox, when it, seems that, when it seemed at every turn that the winds of fate had blown our lives afoul, financially, emotionally, or idealistically. Look at all that we endured. Look at all that we managed to light along our path to the long shadow of adversity. Look at the seemingly indestructible affiliation that was once us, and look at us now. She pretending to be a stranger behind her cakey makeup and impenetrable eyes, and I, pining for access, knowing that if I dare reach out to her, she'll stand up and leave. Wild and tall, I was trying. 